A brief history of environmental health and how it relates to public health practice. We can define environmental health as a branch of public health concerned with all aspects of the natural and built environment affecting human health. So typically divide impacts, uh, environmental health impactors as chemical, physical, and biological. Uh, chemical could be lead in drinking water or exposure to pesticides. Uh, physical could include noise, radiation, and heat or cold stress. Uh, biological includes mosquito-borne diseases and food poisoning. Historic links between environment and disease. From ancient times, there was some recognition of the link between the environment and disease, but the links were poorly understood. Aristotle wrote that he believed that diseases were caused by my miasma or bad odors in boggy areas. It wasn't until the early 1800s before the link was made between disease and mosquitoes. And the germ theory of disease followed the development of the microscope in the 17th century. Pre-industrial sanitation interventions included draining swamps, installing cesspits to collect household waste, rubbish removal, using food preservation through dehydration and fermentation, and building aqueducts to transport fresh water. Poster industrial inter interventions including installation of central water systems, food and milk regulation, installing combined sewer and storm drainage, and sanitation departments to remove rubbish and clean streets. There began to be restrictions on livestock in urban areas and regulations of workplace. These are fairly simple regulations regarding lighting, ventilation, and fire safety. Historical developments that aided or improved environmental health. In 1676, Van Leeuwenhoek makes improvements to the microscope and discovers bacteria this is the beginning of the germ theory of disease. In 1775, the flush toilet was invented, reducing human exposure to feces. In 1834, first practical refrigeration machines was built by Jacob Perkins. 1862, Pasteurization of wine was patented. Soon, milk and beer also began to be pasteurized. 1902, first continuous disinfection of a central water system, and that occurred in Belgium. 1913, mass production of automobiles begins. Cars and trucks replace horses reducing public exposure to flies and manure. Other environmental health milestones. In 1906, under the Roosevelt administration, the Food and Drug Administration was established. 1936, Rural Electrification Act. This allowed the installation of indoor plumbing and cisterns were replaced with water wells, which is a very uh, high quality water source, much better than a cistern. 1963, Clean Air Act regulates smoke, nitrous oxide, sulfur oxides, and ozone. Uh, this was in response to a lot of air pollution in cities. 1968, new cars required to have seat belts. I can remember my dad had a 63 Chevy and I remember him installing seat belts in uh, that car so we could have seat belts. 
1970, Environmental Protection Agency was created. 1972 was the Clean Water Act. So public water treatment, testing, and contamination limits. So those are the first contamination limits we had set on public water. Uh, 1972, OSHA Act uh, introduced a lot of workplace health and safety regulations. And 1972 also, Consumer Product Safety Commission, uh, Safe Toys and Consumer Goods. So these all happened during the Nixon administration. A lot of uh, health and safety regulations got passed. 1975 was the introduction of the catalytic con converter to reduce air pollution. And a big impact that had beyond that was that it required unleaded gas. So since the 1940s, lead had been added to gasoline as an anti knock compound. And that was just a general part of air pollution, especially in urban areas. Uh, people would breathe it, it would contaminate the soil. So this is uh, when we started reducing a lot of the lead in our environment. Uh, 1978, ban on lead in paint and plumbing. And this is 70 years after it was banned in most of Europe. Uh, if you'd like to know more about this, uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital has an excellent article on why it took so long to get lead banned in paint. 1989, severe restrictions on the use of asbestos. Uh, we were aware of uh, the link between asbestos and disease uh, back in 1968 with some research by Dr. Irving Selikoff and uh, it took over 20 years to have a restriction. Uh, Mid-1980s, recognition of radon gas as a significant cause of lung cancer. So in Ohio, some of the milestones. Uh, the Ohio State Board of Health, it was established in 1886, and the board encouraged the formation of local boards of health. <clears throat> 1893, uh, at that point, new public and water and sewer systems need to receive prior approval by the board. 1897, board begins inspecting water systems. So they hire an engineer to start inspecting public water systems. 1898, chemical and biological laboratory established on, established on the OSU campus. 1908, Benz Act authorized the board to require purification of public water and sewer systems. 1909, Ohio River Sanitary Commission formed between four states adjoining the Ohio River. Uh, and this included the, the Ohio River watershed. And this was Ohio's uh, largest water source at that point in time. So that was an attempt to uh, try to regulate and clean up the Ohio River and its watershed. Uh, there are now eight states on this commission and it's known by the term Oransco. 1910, the State Laboratory begins offering diagnostic services for common diseases. 1913, industrial disease reporting required. So Ohio is very early in on this. In 1917, uh, the Board of Health uh, segued into the Ohio Department of Health. Now a little discussion on local boards of health in Ohio. In 1932, the Cleveland Board of Health was formed to combat a cholera epidemic. Uh, this is the first board of health established in Ohio. 1915, Cleveland's Bureau of Dairy and Food Inspection was created. 1918, the Hughes Act eliminated township and village boards of health. So this is an attempt to consolidate uh, boards of health. 
the board numbers were reduced from 2,158 to 80 city and 88 general health districts. The act required at least three full-time employees, a health officer, a nurse, and a clerk, and the state paid for half the salary cost. By the late 1920s, Ohio was considered to have one of the best public health systems in the nation. Next, I want to go over some information I found in an environmental health. Uh, I found it in the Ohio Public Health Manual of 1925. It says health commissioners, public officials, and other persons receiving a copy of the manual must preserve their copy as it will be impossible to supply a duplicate. So we're hanging on to it. Uh, duties of the local boards of health were to abate nuisances inspect schools, and may regulate public gatherings. Must keep a list of all places selling milk or meat. May regulate yards, pens, stables, and the cleaning thereof. May inspect slaughterhouses, dairies, shops, and wagons. And may inspect food and water supplies for animals. Next, we're going to talk about the sanitarian as a profession. In 1925, the Ohio Pel Public Health Manual, uh, sanitarians were called sanitary police and had police powers to make arrests. 1948, Ohio Association of Public Health Sanitarians was created. That's now known as the Ohio Environmental Health Association. 1977, the Ohio Sanitarian Board was created. At that time, registration was voluntary. The board took time to develop education and continuing education criteria. In 1987, they adopted professional standards for sanitarians. Registration became mandatory at that time. 1,300 were registered at that time, and 1,580 are actively active presently. Registrants must meet education and continuing education requirements. Sanitarians in training must have two years of supervision and pass an exam. And in 2019, sanitarians were renamed environmental health specialist. Now we're going to go into some, a few of the different programs we have uh, and their history. Food Safety Ohio, uh, 1948 there was a grade A milk ordinance and milk and meat inspections uh, were conducted by Defiance County as uh, Defiance County hires the first sanitarian. 1953, restaurant and cafeteria inspections began. Some of the requirements were running water inside the building. Uh, my wife's grandfather had a bar down in Cecil, and when the health department came in, told him he had to put water inside the building, he decided to get out of the barkeeping business. Uh, he always just uh, walked to his neighbor's yard with some buckets and would pump some water out his well. Sanitation of plates and glassware with bleach, and we still have this. Horse meat may not be refrigerated in the same unit as human food. Uh, so horse meat's kind of fallen in and out of fashion as a human food. <laughs> and at this point, uh, horses were not being raised for meat, but often as you know work animals or racing for racing and they use uh, drugs on these animals that's not approved for human consumption and so that's typically why uh, horse meat is not consumed today unless it's wild horse meat 
1997, critical control point inspections begin. Uh, there's a focus on the processes for handling food and measuring the temperature during each step of the process to make sure that you know there's not a window where bacteria can be introduced or have a rapid growth phase in the in the food. Uh, 2000 Ohio rules begin to base be based on the FDA model food code. Also, retail food inspections were moved from agriculture to the local health district and food programs are now overseen by both Ohio Department of Health and the Department of Agriculture. Another of our early programs was sewage disposal. 1946, Defiance County had sewage regulations. Uh, we have permits back from this period. Uh, water source needed to be 50 feet from the tank. Uh, this is still uh, a typical regulation, 50 feet from the tank. Only sewage waste from the toilet goes into the tank. Uh, gray water is a separate pipe. So that goes, that just drains to a ditch or a tile. Uh, primary treatment is a 500 gallon tank. Tanks are made from burial vaults, laid brick, concrete, concrete block, and clay tile uh, like crocs. We still have a lot of these around. Um, a few years ago I saw a brick one that really looked like it's in good shape from for as old as it was. Secondary treatment was required. Uh, 200 feet of leach field, which we have leach fields today, but they're a lot bigger. Uh, 150 square foot sand filter. Again, modern systems are a lot larger. Uh, 40 rods or an eighth of a mile of clay field tile. 1977, Ohio regulations were adopted and all wastewater was to go to the septic system. Tanks and secondary treatment areas increase in size correspondingly. Secondary treatment required for aeration tanks. So uh, in the 60s, uh, Defiance County started, there started being aeration tanks installed in Defiance County. Uh, these were allowed the creation of small lots because they don't take up any more space than a septic tank. Uh, and we kind of, we're kind of living with that now. They have no secondary treatment and a lot of them are poorly maintained. Uh, but uh, in 77, that required a secondary treatment. Uh, this is usually an evapotranspiration mound, uh, which is basically a big sand mound, or they could use a five foot by five foot upflow sand filter. Field tile is no longer considered uh, proper for secondary treatment. Uh, one thing we've learned with the harmful algal blooms and the research that's gone into that is that a uh, septic tank that empties into a field tile, uh, it'll accumulate uh, nutrients and bacteria. And why, while it may not be polluting uh, all the time, when there's a big rain, it kind of flushes those tiles out and you'll have a large deposit of bacteria and nutrients into the water. More on sewage treatment. Uh, in 2002, the Northwest Ohio Sanitarians start our soils training. So we're de developing ways to design for the individual site based on the soils that are there. 2007, we pass local regulations. New systems must use soil-based treatment. Discharge is no longer allowed. 2015, Ohio adopts new sewage rules after 38 years, and it was a long haul. Um, some of the requirements were contractor bonding and six hours of education per year. Uh, local health departments have to develop an operation permit system. Private water systems, 
As far back as 1943, well drillers were required to submit well logs and drilling reports to the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. 1981, we got private water rules, required permits and completion forms filled out by the contractors, and also required health districts to collect water samples to test to make sure the water was safe to drink. We had some rule revisions in 1999 and 2000. Now the contractors are required to re be registered with Ohio Department of Health and bonded. Uh, Betonite or cement grout required to seal annular spaces between the well casing and the soil. Uh, so typically prior to this time, a lot of drillers would seal this space with cuttings that came out from uh, the actual drilling of the well and that was not considered no longer to be able to seal that well properly because the cuttings could uh, kind of expand and contract and kind of let surface water through and uh, contaminate the drinking water source. Uh, 2020s are last water rule revisions so now uh, continuing education is required on for water contractors also have to get six hours. And on our pond systems, they began to require granular activated carbon to remove potential toxins from harmful algal blooms. And the last program I wanted to talk about is uh, public swimming pools. So these were largely unregulated uh, in the beginning of the century. Uh, 1950 was the first year that uh, pools had to submit their, pool operators had to submit their plans to ODH to get them approved. And also in the 19, early 1950s, uh, sanitarians tried to proceed pools to install chlorination. And this is to combat polio I had two brothers that had polio and uh, my dad always described that they were ostracized because the fear was so uh, great with this disease because it you know attacked young people. Uh, so at that point in time, generally pools, they either brought in fresh water every day or they put some chlorine at the beginning of the day, but they didn't have an automatic or continuous chlorine feeder. So the, a lot of this discussion was like, you need to continuously, you know, check your chlorine on your pool. 1955, the polio vaccine was developed. 1987, uh, state rules require swimming pools to be licensed by the local board of health. So this begins uh, the local board of health inspection program for public swimming pools. 1908, uh, Virginia Graham Baker Act, and this is to protect bathers from suction or entrapment. Um, so there was a concern of drownings caused by people getting their bodies or their hair sucked up against a, a drain on a pool that had suction on it and they would drown or if they had uh, land on it right, they could even be eviscerated. Uh, Ohio had a version of this in 1999, so a lot of these problems were taken care of in Ohio prior to the Virginia Graham Baker Act, but it also had some uh, more far-ranging uh, things that had to be taken out on a national basis. Expanding roles and fields of knowledge. Um, in 1993, uh, Jack in the Box which is a fast food chain on the West Coast, had an outbreak associated with undercooked hamburgers carrying E. coli 0157, caused by hemolytic, caused, it caused hemolytic uremic syndrome in children. Uh, there's no real treatment for it. They either uh, clear it themselves or they don't. Uh, so this led to more uh, intense uh, 
inspection of food operations and how they handle their food. 1994, uh, Cleveland outbreak of infant deaths due to black mold. 1998, body art regulations were passed to prevent bloodborne disease. 1990s, bed bugs resurge in the US. So uh, environmental health specialists are having to keep updated on what's the next thing coming down the road. And uh, so giving people advice on bed bugs or mold uh, has been a common uh, call we get. 2001, West Nile virus was found in Ohio birds and mosquitoes. Uh, killed a lot of birds, uh, made a lot of people sick. 2002, there's a greater focus on emergency preparedness after 9-11. 2007 was a smoke-free workplace regulation. And uh, this was a very popular regulation. And in fact, that uh, most uh, facilities were eager to comply or find a way to comply with the regulation, although it was difficult at times. Uh, and we had you know, a few places that didn't want to comply. Overall, the cooperation on this program was great. 2007 with also Jared's Law, uh, it covered health and safety in schools. Uh, had a focus on you know safety in playgrounds and also inside the school and also indoor air quality uh, as it relates to mold and moisture problems. Uh, we did get a lot of unsafe playground equipment off the out of the schools. Uh, since we out actually had standards now. Uh, and I feel kind of good about that. And uh, school inspections continue. 2009, Ohio Lyme disease outbreak begins as black legged tick moves into Ohio. 2014, Toledo water crisis uh, due to a harmful algal bloom out on Lake Erie. That's where they get their drinking water. And this, you know, kind of sh sent shockwaves throughout the country that uh, city's water system would shut down because of something like this. Uh, led to much greater awareness of, you know, the importance of cleaning, having clean water systems and, and clean water, clean rivers, clean streams. 2020, uh, we had the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, so we acted as COVID-19 operations as an advisory role in restricting commercial activity and public gatherings. Yes, we can. Environmental health success story. Okay, I was not aware of this, but I came aware when they uh, were talking about Jimmy Carter's birthday recently. Uh, the Carter Foundation has been working to eradicate guinea worm disease since 1986. Guinea worm disease an infection caused by a parasite and contaminated water. In 1986, there were 3.5 million cases. In 2022, there were 13 cases. It is close to total eradication. It was accomplished through environmental health education measures basically teaching people water protection and purification practices. Last disease, disease totally eradicated was smallpox in 1980. And I'd like to conclude with some present challenges. So developing health standards through accreditation. Uh, so this process forces us to look at the fine details of our standards and how we accomplish our goals. Building health equity in all programs. That means uh, treating people of different races or ethnicities, making sure they have equity in our programs. Uh, geographic information systems. We do have a 
geographic information through amalgam called fetch and we're constantly putting data on there uh, this allows us to look when we're looking at a site to not only look at the site we're looking at but to look at adjoining parcels and adjoining sites seeing if there's any you know impact or restrictions we need to be looking at it's been very helpful uh, getting a, a real good uh, idea between location and what some kind of restriction might be electronic record keeping and tracking systems uh, so we currently use electronic record keeping uh, that kind of goes over the cloud and it has been very helpful in retrieving records uh, still a lot of records to load to it but uh, it's, it's making things quicker and easy to do and that's always good we have a continuing need to educate environmental health specialists as new fields of concern come up uh, and we are currently providing education and information to sewage contractors food workers and managers and general public so we've doing, been doing the sewage contractors since about 2016 uh, food workers and managers this just got started up these last two years and the general public uh, we start providing education on O&M last fall and the last challenge I had was building resiliency for global climate change into programs. So we're already doing this to some extent in our sewage program um, by anticipating uh, larger, more severe storms that might impact, impact the uh, sewage treatment systems. But I think we also need to look at uh, challenges for you know getting clean water and uh, other issues so uh, this is a presentation and you know thank you